completely dark room, given we have all those beautiful glass rooms upstairs. But the idea of the architect was to give you a feeling of the darkness in the north. <laughs> uh, and when you exit this room, you will get the feeling we get in Scandinavia in springtime when light just hits us. And if you come to Scandinavia and those, uh, in April or May and the sun is out, you will see everyone sitting on the staircases outside with their noses in the air trying to get the first spring light. But it's also a great uh, venue, I think, to have conferences like this. And uh, hopefully you will not be, be distracted and want to have your eyes wandering off but if they do, on the walls, we have a fantastic new photo exhibit by an Icelandic photojournalist. His name is Ragnar Axelsson. And he's showing uh, pictures of Icelandic glaciers that if we don't do anything uh, on climate change, uh, these glaciers will actually be gone in two centuries. So I think it's a fitting, fitting images. And this uh, exhibit is sponsored and hung here by our friends, the Icelandic Embassy, who is also located in our building. So please enjoy them. And of course, upstairs uh, where we entered, uh, we have an exhibit on urbanization uh, I, that I hope you can enjoy as well. So anyway, a warmly welcome to the House of Sweden, where we will today focus on uh, green diplomacy, uh, creating cities of the future. First of all, of course, I would like to thank uh, the EU delegation and other EU member states for all the collaboration in putting this together. And uh, we are pleased that the program also showcases the participation from the EU. Well, uh, our event is streamed live today, uh, and I understand that we ha will have and we have viewers from all over the world. So we are really happy to have all of you on camera participating. And thank you also to our speakers and audience here in DC for coming here uh, this morning. So this is the second time I'm posted in uh, Washington, DC. And I really think the city has changed a lot since I came here uh, first time 11 years ago. And it's really fascinating to follow, uh, follow the change. Uh, in this city, I really feel that urbanization is strong, fast, and brings many opportunities and challenges, uh, like in other places of the world, of course. By 2050, two-thirds of the world's population will actually live in cities, according to the United Nations. So the global challenge of expanding cities is one where Sweden could inspire, I hope, uh, as sustainability has been pivotal in the planning of many Swedish cities for quite some time now. And I hope a few of you, at least, were here in the room to, uh, to catch a glimpse, glimpse of Greta Thunberg's talk to the EU Parliament uh, earlier this spring, which we showed just before I took the stage. We really thought it was appropriate to start with uh, Greta Thunberg uh, as the EU Green Diplomacy Week of 2019, focus on climate change and youth. And as many of you uh, know, I'm sure Greta Thunberg is from Sweden and began at the age of 15 protesting outside the Swedish parliament for the need of immediate action to combat climate change and has since then become an out outspoken climate activist. And I understand that we will hear from other youths uh, here uh, and be inspired by them later this morning. And Greta Thunberg is really inspiring, I think. Greta was just in Austria at the R20 Austrian World Summit yesterday, together with Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, another great, great climate activist. Uh, and the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, he tweeted about her. Young people like Greta Thunberg are driving transforma transformative climate action around the world. They must keep up the pressure on their leaders to save our planet and our future. But I think it's people like you here in the room who are experts and who are working on this that also really need to, to work hard. And of course, with pr pressure put on, on our youth, but we should help the youth to, of course, deliver for their future. And in my country, we take climate change uh, seriously. Uh, more than half of Sweden's national energy supply comes from renewables. Uh, and through legislation uh, aims to further reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Sweden's goal is to be carbon neutral by 2045. And in Sweden, it's cities and municipalities that uh, lead the way. Uh, Sweden's architects, construction firms, energy companies, city planners, enterprises and politicians are working 
together and today to create sustainable cities of tomorrow. That is what our discussion will focus on today. How do we create the cities for the future? Uh, representatives from one of those forward-looking Swedish cities is here today. Uh, he is from Helsingborg, and Helsingborg is on the west coast of Sweden, quite far south, uh, has been ranked as Sweden's most environmentally friendly municipality over the last three years. This event is also part of uh, the embassy's public diplomacy program for 2019. It's called Smart Societies. We engage in a year-long program on urban planning, uh, democratic architecture, and smart cities under the collective metaphor of smart societies. Uh, well, Sweden pushed the frontiers of urban development, both at na national and municipal um, level. We see new uh, technologies emerge. We welcome fresh uh, forms of planning and put newly developed business models into practice. Together, we welcome the emergence of the new. We are focusing on broad social values, such as inclusion, equality, creativity, and of course, environmental sustainability. And it is necessary and urgent. I find it very hard to accept uh, that there are people who actually uh, debate if there is climate change or not. I think the glaciers of I Iceland is proof of that. And why take a chance? We must do something. So uh, this is uh, exactly what Greta Thunberg calls for, of course. On that note, uh, please, after I finish speaking, uh, watch the video messages from youth activists. We have Faith Lewis, Jess Nichols, and Boof van Horix. And we will also listen to Maros uh, Sevkovic, the Vice President of the European Commission for the Energy uh, Union. After these films, uh, Mr. David Livingston from the Atlantic Council will take over and moderate today's discussion. So again, warmly welcome to the House of Sweden and the Embassy of Sweden. I hope you will have a great uh, morning here together with us to talk about these extremely important issues. So thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, on the occasion of the 2019 Climate Diplomacy Week, I'd like to emphasize the central role which cities should play in delivering on the Paris Agreement. Today, every second person lives in a city, and by 2050, it will be two-thirds of all people globally. The young people of today will grow up in cities, and it is also in cities that will be decided the fate of our climate and environment. Already today, cities account for 70% of world's greenhouse gas emissions and growing. So I'm always surprised when I see national policymakers discuss energy, climate, mobility or buildings without placing cities at the center of their thinking. But the good news in my experience is that mayors, both in Europe and around the world, take things in their own hands. They want to be trailblazers for cleaner, healthier future and don't wait for national policies to move ahead. And frontrunners reap the benefits of their ambition. In cities, innovation and sustainability go hand in hand with good mobility, energy savings and clean air. This attracts economic opportunities and provides the quality of life that citizens demand. That's why I'm so proud of my role as a co-chair of the board of the Global Covenant of Mayors. The European Commission was a key founding partner of the Covenant and today there are over 9,200 participating cities, over 10% of global population. In Europe, one in two Europeans lives in a Covenant city. It's an essential platform for cities to get inspiration and knowledge from one another. And as a European Union, we are determined to do all we can to help cities realize their ambitions. A key way in which we are doing this is facilitating investment. For example, we put in place Orbis, a specific investment advisory service for cities looking to find ways to finance their projects, but struggling to navigate the financial system. And for European cities that want to be living laboratories, pioneering new solutions, 
we have a research program of over 100 million euro a year called Smart Cities and Communities. Those at the forefront go faster. But we also make sure no city is left behind. Our regional funds allow for catching up and transformation of cities that still need to deal with the infrastructure of the past. And we are keen on exchanging experiences with cities around the world. Cities in the United States are a key partner. Without close links between Europe and the US, we would be missing plenty of opportunities. There is so much we can accomplish by working together for a common goal. We can thank youth activists for reinforcing our sense of urgency. It's now our task to get on with the job. My name is Bo, I'm 13 years old and I'm one of the school strikers in Belgium. Hi, my name is Jess. I'm 14 years old and I live in the southwest of England. Since February this year, I have been striking for my school to demand the climate crisis is treated with sufficient urgency. Hello, my name is Faith Lewis and I attend American University in Washington, D.C. My specific focus is on environmental justice, which acknowledges that people of color and individuals with low income, in addition to other marginalized groups, are disproportionately affected by environmental degradation. I strike because I'm terrified of what will happen if we don't act now. We are facing the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced, preventing the extinction of our species. I take a stand because I've lived on three continents and I've recognized that the legacies of discrimination in so many contexts incorporate a gross disregard for the health and well-being of people and their environments. My first climate action was in October 20, 2018. After Greta Thunberg started striking, 70 youth from my hometown walked 70 kilometers to Brussels to demand climate action from our politicians. Youth engagement, such as the organizing work of 16-year-old black climate activist Isra Hersey, is of the utmost importance. We're told to turn the lights off when we leave the room or take shorter showers to preserve precious resources. And while these actions are beneficial, they are a pale imitation of the true action that needs to be taken and facilitated by those in positions of power. It is important that we reject quick fix, solutionist, and technocratic um, solutions to our problems. Last week, two reports were published by Belgian academics, and they gave me a lot of hope, because if we start to act now, it is still possible to keep global warming under the two degrees Celsius. We cannot bury our heads in the sand and hide away from this any longer. We're in the midst of an existential climate breakdown. We will not be able to stop it unless every single person wakes up, listens to the science, and acts. But the onus should be on the cities and on public authorities in encouraging this participation by illustrating, through their actions, that engagement yields equitable and effective results. We have to start to work together. You have to start to work together. As nations, as continents, and as a world. Because we all need that same blue planet. Join us in the fight for our futures. Thank you for listening to someone who cannot vote yet and whose future is into your hands. When the voices of all people are respected, I believe that our cities and our world will be safer, happier, and healthier. Terrific. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Livingston. Uh, I work at the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, where I lead the Atlantic Council's work on climate and clean energy. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be uh, sort of your, your MC and your moderator today. Um, I know we're running a few minutes behind schedule. Um, I know you probably all have important things to get onto today. So we'll keep things very short uh, here in the beginning. I'll throw in some, some further guiding facts and details as the day goes along. We're going to start off with a series of fireside chats. Obviously, the chat will have no fire, uh, but it will still be just as intimate. Um, with a, as warm a day as we have and as warm a morning as we have in DC, I think uh, no one would welcome the addition of a fireplace this morning. Um, so with that, let's kick things right off. And let me, uh, let me call up here for, for our first fireside chat, uh, Jakub Gibek, who is the head of, climate, of the Climate Policy Unit in the Ministry of Environment for, for the country of Poland 
and also uh, serves a key role in the Bureau of the COP24 presidency as Poland looks set to hand off things uh, uh, to Chile in Santiago later this December. Welcome up, Jakub. Good morning, everybody. Right. Testing, perfect. All right, Jakub, let's jump right into this. We're going to dive back into cities shortly, but first let's zoom out, maybe give us a little bit of context. Um, can you give us an update on the state of global climate negotiations? Uh, where do things stand um, from Poland's perspective? Uh, and then from there, maybe we can help to situate the role of youth and cities within that global context. Okay. Um, well, as you all, all were definitely, uh, we have Paris Agreement agreed in 2015. It's a um, um, major legal framework for all the climate action, but it needed to be supplemented by implementing provisions because uh, the, the broad framework doesn't suffice. And um, uh, after adoption of uh, Paris Agreement in 2015, um, all the nations focused for next three years their work on, on uh, working out those uh, implementing provisions. We managed to do this in Katowice. We adopted Katowice Rulebook, um, which covers almost all implementing provisions needed for Paris Agreement to be operational since uh, 2021. So um, the climate negotiations are, are there, but um, after um, the publication of the latest IPCC report in, in October 2018, there, there is a huge change in attitudes. And um, uh, we, are, we, we can see not only the environmental activists speaking about um, climate change, uh, that's, that, that became a universal topic for all the conversations in all the countries. Um, and um, this change of attitudes is also visible on a governmental uh, level. We are moving away from climate negotiations to climate action. And everybody is um, on the same side. We need to start implementing climate actions for the change to happen before it's too late. As we move then from negotiations to action, that also implies, uh, at least implicitly, a move towards a more broad base of engagement. Uh, it, it becomes more grassroots. You, you know, th there are more stakeholders at the table than just those that can show up for the COP negotiations every year. What does the move from negotiations to climate action imply for the role that cities, local leaders, mayors that we'll hear from later today, uh, as well as youth activists? What, what role do they play in this? Well, this, this role is and will is immense and will be growing. Um, the governments adopted the, the uh, provisions that build the foundation, solid foundation for all the non-party stakeholders to act. Like uh, now, nobody can tell that um, there is any unclar uh, unclarity what to do next, what will be the regime, how to how to um, um, account for the actions, how to verify, and so on. This is in place. Now everybody has to contribute. It's not like the governments themselves will be able to solve the climate change problem. No. We need the involvement of all non-state actors. We need uh, the involvement of uh, scientific community. We need innovations. Uh, we need new technologies. We need uh, cities and local governments to be there because they know what actions are needed and most efficient on the local level. We need YAS. It's, it's very visible, not only, well, it's, it's obvious in this place in the house of Sweden to, to talk about the, the role of the YAS, but um, we had European elections last Sunday, and um, for the first time in history, climate change was the major topic of climate, um, uh, of uh, environmental elections, and uh, there are some countries in Europe where the uh, first-time voters voted for Greens in terms of by 30% of them, 35%, that's, that's the case for Germany, 35% of those first-time first voters voted for people who want to really fight climate change. Even if Bo from Belgium said he cannot vote yet, he will be probably there to vote in five years. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the, that's the real sign for the politicians to change their attitudes, to change the focus of what, of, uh, what they are doing. Cities are central for mitigation and for adaptation. This is the place where the people live, where the people consume, uh, where the shape of future uh, patterns in terms of consumption, in terms of uh, mobility and so on, is shaped. So um, we need to find the best solutions, we need to find quick fixes, uh, and we need to start implementing them on a broad basis. And that's why we should start with the cities as the center for uh, human activity. And indeed, uh, just to kind of tee up some of our later discussions today, I thought it would be apt uh, to, since we're right next door, since we're essentially neighbors this morning with the Kennedy Center, uh, one of the most beautiful and poignant things said about the importance of cities in our, in, our, in our lives was said by actually President John F. Kennedy, who said, we neglect our cities to our peril, for in neglecting them, we neglect the nation. I would add, you know, he said this uh, half a century ago, of course, but I would add to that that in an age of climate disruption, to neglect our cities would also be to neglect our shared future, um, to neglect the prosperity of this planet and its people, um, including generations that are just beginning their journey, like the youth. Uh, with, with that, let me also, speaking of coalitions and broad-based action, uh, in my excitement to get our conversation started today, I neglected to thank just a few people who were instrumental in putting this together. So let me just explicitly thank uh, Ambassador Olaf Stutter for the, the hospitality of having us here in the beautiful House of Sweden. Thank you to the EU delegation and to uh, Ambassador Lombardidis. A special thanks to Dagmara Kaska of the, of the EU uh, delegation who was instrumental in, in putting everything together today. Uh, and, and also thank you to the, to the other member states uh, who, though not officially represented up here on the stage, also play an incredibly important role in adding their contributions to today's event and to the ongoing programming that the EU delegation does around these themes. With that, let's focus in on a specific member state, Poland. Uh, Poland is Poland's own priorities, its own goals uh, for its management of COP24 and now for its continued management of the transition process as, as Chile takes over with COP25, they're not often well understood. Could you give us a little bit more specificity and, and, and enlighten us a little bit about what Poland's specific priorities are when it comes to climate and maybe how those priorities touch on youth or on cities, whether it be just transition or other matters? Well, uh, here we have to uh, distinguish between the role of Poland as a um, party to the climate convention and what we are doing for the climate and be a part P Poland as a presidency of COP24. Mm -hmm. Because uh, our role as a COP presidency is a bit different than like for other, all other nations that are trying to, to, to push the climate actions forward. Um, in Katowice, our main priority was the adoption of uh, Katowice rulebook, of course, but we wanted also to um, ignite the, the, the discussion on how every single action can contribute to climate uh, um, protection. Uh, we <coughs> focused on three areas um, to show that there are possible solutions uh, in different sectors, like uh, in uh, transport, uh, sector transport is uh, the, the, their contribution to um, uh, um, emission of greenhouse gases is growing and uh, it's growing really fast so we need to start thinking about the solutions how to mitigate this effect and we we propose the partnership between governments and non-state actors uh, to um, introduce to to well to um, push forward the concept of electromobility um, we managed to gather over 3,000 partners so far that um, um, joined this partnership, including, uh, including many um, uh, local governments. There are over 1,500 of them there. Uh, we propose the, the, the concept of just transition. Just transition is, um, is for us the key to um, sustainable, but also socially acceptable climate action. Because um, as we see from um, Examples in uh, some member states, the public is demanding climate action now, but on the same, uh, at, at the same time, the public is sometimes opposing the governments that are trying to introduce changes. Mm. 
uh, in order to, to uh, bring this climate action uh, because it influences their, uh, their life. And uh, we need to prepare the public for this change because uh, we cannot stop global warming without changing a lot in our consumption patterns, in our life patterns, and so on. The concept of just transition is aiming at providing a bridge to this sustainable future, but with uh, social acceptance, with uh, decent jobs, with social inclusion, with many other important things that would be not able to, uh, without them, we would be able to really change the, the, the future of, of this planet. And um, Poland is a, is a specific um, example also. And here I come to, to your the, the second part. We have a lot of to do in Poland in terms of climate change. Um, uh, back in the 80s, we were 100% uh, coal uh, fired in terms of electricity production. Now we are moving slowly in the direction of uh, going green. But this transition requires time and money. And um, we are talking about really huge investments. So um, it's, it, it will take us a bit time. And I cannot, I, I would love to, to, um, to be able to um, share the, the declaration of our Swedish um, hosts here that they will go carbon neutral by 2045. Uh, we won't be able to, to, to get there, but we still... Um, federal government has with states and then within states, um, cities. So there's a sort of nesting doll uh, type of aspect to how we run things. And um, obviously, President Trump um, is not uh, concerned about the climate crisis. In fact, he's actively trying to... Uh, roll back uh, many, a thing, many of the things that President Obama did to respond to it. Um, but despite that, which gets a lot of attention, there still are, you know, federal tax credits uh, that are, have been really critical for the deployment of renewables, wind and solar in particular. Um, there has continued to be uh, bipartisan support uh, for investments at the Department of Energy in clean energy technology. So, you know, there's a lot of um, talk and, and light on, um, on attempts to roll back things, but kind of where it comes to the working of the government, uh, a lot of what has really driven the U.S.'s ability to move forward is, is still in place. Um, it's inadequate to the task. We really must have the federal government engaged to rise to the challenge. And that's why I think you're seeing in the Democratic primary in particular, so many of the candidates uh, engaging in it. Uh, and, you know, serving at those levels of government uh, bring um, different, different aspects of, uh, of um, experience uh, that can help, help get things done. Um, but actually, I think climate change will feature in the 2020 election like it has uh, in no other um, in the United States. Um, and that's actually largely because President Trump has attacked climate policy so directly. So um, it's an easy thing uh, for an opponent to, to take on. Um, and Mother Nature has helped uh, raise the profile given uh, just unfortunately, the storms, the wildfires, the flooding uh, that we've seen in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let me, uh, final question. I, I, it's a personal curiosity, but I'm sure shared by others here in, in the audience as well. What are some of the priorities yet to play out for the committee? What should we have our eye on? What are some of the, maybe the stories you think aren't getting enough attention? It's your opportunity, kind of in, in final words, to flag for us what we should be uh, keeping a close eye on over the next year or two. Okay. Um, well, you know, I think we really will want to be um, filling in um, some gaps that either are new uh, and haven't had attention yet or are burgeoning. Um, so I think offshore wind 
Um, you know, we really have only had very uh, few projects going forward so far in the U.S. I think the committee um, will want to look into that and how we can support that and how I think it can be a test case for um, incorporating, um, making sure we're creating not just the electricity, um, but also the jobs in the industry that come with it. So I think we'll be very interested in, in seeing what the federal government can do to help that. Um, I, the IPCC's 1.5 degree report, I think got a lot of people's attention when they were talking about uh, drawing carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, I think that is a very um, new policy area for Congress to be looking at. So I think we'll be trying to be helpful there. And I would say overall um, on the resiliency side, um, the policy development there is, is just, n is pretty immature. Um, and we have a lot of ideas and things that have worked at the state and local level on reducing emissions. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, we can really add some value on, um, on resiliency uh, and put forward some, some ideas there. Terrific. These are all topics uh, close to the Atlantic Council's heart. We have a resilience center, and I know that many of us share, the, share your, your belief that offshore wind is an incredibly exciting opportunity for the U.S. Um, and for governors and, and, and local leaders here as well. So, Anna, with that, thank you very much for joining this morning, and best of luck with the rest of your work. And let me welcome up next uh, Mayor Grant. Please come on up for our final fireside chat of the day. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mayor Grant serves as the mayor of Seat Pleasant, Maryland. Um, I think you've witnessed firsthand some of the opportunities and challenges in creating sustainable cities and meeting the climate crisis and dealing with the impacts of climate change, severe weather events uh, already as they're articulating themselves in Maryland. Why don't we jump right in, tell us a little bit about Seat Pleasant. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the community that, that you represent and lead and, uh, and some of the relevant issues to what we're discussing here today. Sure, thank you so very much. We're just excited to be here. Uh, we welcome all of those who are members of the EU here to the United States and thank the ambassador. Uh, where did she go? I thought she was here. Oh, there you are. Thank you, ambassador. <laughs> we love you. We thank you so very much for opening up the House of Sweden to us. Uh, for this exciting conversation. Uh, C. Pleasant, Maryland, for those who are not familiar, but after this presentation you will be familiar, uh, uh, is uh, right outside of Washington, D.C., in the great state uh, of Maryland. We are a small bedroom uh, community of about 4,700 wonderful residents who give me no problems whatsoever. <laughs> and, um, but uh, we are faced with challenges like any uh, city uh, in the United States, particularly um, on the border of Washington, D.C., that D.C., as you all know, gets most of the attention because it is our nation's uh, capital. There are 26 other municipalities in Prince George's County where we're located, a total of 157 municipalities in uh, the great state uh, of Maryland. And oftentimes when we have conversations regarding cities, most of those conversations are centered around large uh, cities. Mm -hmm. And I'm an advocate for small cities. Mm -hmm. And so you hear discussions uh, about sustainability, resiliency, et cetera, and the need for them in the large cities like New York, LA, Chicago, Houston, the four largest cities uh, in the United States. But the reality is that the vast majority of cities in the United States are small. 80% of cities in the United States have populations of 10,000 or less. 60% have populations of 5,000 or less. And they have been left out in the discussion, and I'm glad that we are having this platform to elevate the discussion for small cities in the United States, but as well as around the world. As large cities become larger by 2050, they are going to be challenged with the ability to meet the needs of their constituency every single day. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure is crumbling in each of these areas. Waste is going to have to be discussed. 
food is going to have to be discussed, energy is going to have to be discussed, and how will you be able to meet the demands that residents are going to have from these large cities that are not going to be able to do that. So therefore, we welcome you to small <laughs> cities in the United States to live where we have a more conscience to the environment and educating our residents about being more friendly to the environment because this earth that we live on is the one that has to take care of us. Therefore, we have a responsibility and obligation to take care of our earth. 4,700, you said? Yes. Y that is the size. You can literally, as mayor, unlike the mayor of Houston, unlike the mayor of Los Angeles, you can know every single member of your community. You can touch the lives directly of every single member of your community. How does that change the way that you lead the city, that you make policy decisions? And how does that even change the way that uh, for a small city like yours that a smart city looks, right? It's a lot different when you're in a smart city of millions of people who you may never meet and they are just data points that you're trying to optimize, obviously for the right reasons. For you though, their names, their faces, their people with stories that you've known, that you've probably grown up with over time. How does that change your approach to, to data in cities as well? So we're excited to be the world's first authentic small smart city. And, and, and as that, there are three words that we really focus upon, which is engage, educate, and empower, is what we are all about. And so just to say that you're a smart city is not enough. Just to say that you have this collection of data uh, to drive your decisions is not enough. But why are you doing that? And having a connection with your residents and understanding who they are, understanding their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, but the challenges uh, that they are faced with every day, a that can fulfill uh, them reaching the zenith of their ambitions and helping them to meet the challenges that they are faced with uh, every single day. And so as we are moving forward in our city and we're talking with our residents and, and engaging with them, one of the things that we utilize is our My C Pleasant app. And so you are able to download the app and engage with the government 24-7. We are the first city, uh, a small city, if you will, in the United States that's utilizing IBM's Watson. So artificial intelligence is being uh, utilized so that we can respond to our citizens at the time that they need. So you don't have to necessarily get with me, but you can get with the systems that we're putting in place. Before the year is out, we have a partnership with the Greater Washington Board of Trade that we're going to be rolling out kiosks in the city, but we will be the first city in the United States that will have an avatar, it'll look like me, uh, uh, that our residents will be able to go and interact with to get their questions answered uh, for them. So let me give you an example of how the smart city works in our city and, and, and is helping our residents. So asthma is an issue and allergies is an issue for many of our residents in, in the area. And so for some, our residents, because we're a walkable community, many of our residents want to go out and take a walk. Our, older population, some of our younger population want to take a jog, et cetera. But because the traffic is ho so high, uh, every day we have over 100,000 cars that are coming through our community because we're right on the border of the District of Columbia. So people in Maryland are coming into Washington to go to work. So as they are doing that, they're leaving all of this carbon around in my community. Very serious and very big problem. So we're able to send out notifications via the app to our residents as to the best times to come out and jog, what route they should take. Maybe you should not take this route because between 6 a.m. and 8.30 a.m., we have a lot of carbon being emitted through the cars, et cetera, traveling in those areas. So that is one, just one simple example that we're using to engage with our residents to educate our residents about the impact of carbon uh, emission in our community and how to educate them or empower them uh, to respond to the challenges that they are faced with. Do you have other cities coming to you trying to learn uh, how you do it, what you're doing, uh, how it works, how you got buy-in from your community? Uh, do you have other mayors knocking on your door? I imagine that there's a lot of curiosity. So we have been very fortunate. We are now traveling around the world. 
given presentations. We were just in Beijing, then Nanjing, and then we went from Nanjing to uh, South Korea, uh, Washington State, uh, and then Silicon Valley. Uh, we've been traveling around to various places, educating and sharing. One of the models that we've created, and, and when you talk about uh, the climate issue here in the United States, those who don't feel that it's an issue, obviously it's an economic issue uh, for them. It's all about making money. And so now we have to find ways to counter that and show them that you still can be profitable I don't know how much profit you really need, but you can still be profitable and still be a friend to the environment at the same time. So we've created a model in our city where we formed a for-profit corporation that is able to sell subscriptions to smaller municipalities because they don't have the large dollars to transport themselves digitally into a smart city. So what we've created is a model where they can buy a subscription at a much cheaper cost so that they can go through that digital transformation. This is what we can do in America, and we can compete with the large cities and be greater and more environmentally friendly to attract more residents to live in these bedroom communities and offer great amenities for them to live, work, play, and stay in the communities that are small in our country. <laughs> this is amazing. You've heard of B2B. This is C2C. This C2C. is city-to-city city city to city business, city-to-city city. City services. This is terrific. Uh, Mr. Mayor, will the will the avatar live on after your after your term as mayor? Will you always be the the digital the digital personification of C. Pleasant? I'm quite certain that the mayor coming after me will probably have a little problem with, with that, <laughs> but certainly uh, maybe some of the residents will advocate for the avatar to stay. Well, one thing will one thing will live on though, which is your legacy of creating. And if I'm correct, because there were a lot of there were a lot of words here that 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 appeal to people, including millennials like me. Certified, sustainable, smart, small city. Maybe small batch as well. So throw it in for you know for our friends in Brooklyn. Yes, this is terrific. It's very exciting. Um, keep up the great work. We will all, I'm sure, now remember. Seat Pleasant will be first in our minds. Uh, it, it'll continue to punch above its weight, and and we'll all be rooting for you to uh, to have much success in all these exciting projects. Thank you so very Thank much. Thank you very much. And with that, um, why don't we roll right in now, jump right into panel one. So if I can have our if I can have our panelists for panel one come right up and join me on the stage. We're gonna start with a short video. More and more people live in cities. By 2030, 60% of the world's population will live their lives in urban environments. We need to change and foster change in order to act on new and greater needs. We need to find smarter solutions and better ways to build cities where both the people and planet can thrive. It's quite clear what we have to do. We have to change and truly focus on a number of areas that are attracting increasing attention across the globe. In this, we need to be humble, to learn and listen to those who have something to share. But we also need to be braver than ever before, daring to invest in new, unexplored paths going forward. The city of Helsingborg just took a stand. Over three years, we will make an investment of a type that Sweden has never seen before, allocating earmarked resources to all departments in our city. These resources can only be used for one thing, innovation to test new tools and techniques, forge new paths, and collaborate with parties outside the organization. Now we're looking for others to join us on this journey. The ones with the ideas, the disruptors, the ones who want to drive change and make a difference. The brave, the bold, and why not the crazy ones? Because the companies and organizations that lead their industries forward also shape our lives in the city. In 2022, all this work will be showcased in a city expo that puts the best innovations on display, that raises the sharpest questions, and invites participants to explore and take part in new urban designs, all the things that come together to compose life in the city. In 1955, one million people visited the Design Expo H55. 
1999, 400,000 came to the Housing Expo H99. Now we're setting our sights on H22, a city expo exploring a smarter and more sustainable urban development and city life. This is our next step. What's yours? Welcome to join our journey and welcome to H22. Terrific. Uh, that sets the table for our next discussion. Uh, panel one, sustainability matters for cities and the planet. Um, let me briefly introduce our, our, uh, our, our illustrious panel. First, um, Hendrik Frindberg is the environmental director for the city of Helsingborg, recently named, I believe, the, the world's most sustainable city, uh, or at least Europe's most sustainable city. Um, but we'll hear more about that shortly. Uh, Lisa McNeely is Director of Sustainability for the City of Baltimore. Um, uh, Axel Baumler is Senior Infrastructure Economist at the World Bank. And immediately to my left, Daniel Connor is a Senior Advisor in the Office of the Director, the Department of Energy and Environment for the DC Government. Um, and just got done uh, uh, with the legwork setting up a new Green Bank, which I know we'll be excited to talk about. Let me start with Henrik, though, because uh, Henrik, you've probably had the longest journey here. Uh, and so, and, and it's already, you know, you're right in the middle of the day in the afternoon in terms of your, your, your body clock. So, so let's have you lead off. Tell us a little bit more about Helsingborg. Tell us a little bit more about some of the ambitious plans that have, put it, that have been put in place there uh, and, and what you're doing as a city that's so innovative. Yes, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we started our work for about uh, 10 years ago and we sat down with uh, a lot of parts uh, in the society and uh, we were talking to NGOs and businesses, politics and schools and we created our vision for Helsingborg. And uh, the vision uh, is deliberately broad and it's about uh, having a, a creative and balanced and uh, a pulsing city. And uh, to become this, uh, we have, um, to reach this, we have, uh, uh, we have some uh, goals that are shorter. And uh, one of the goals is uh, the one that you've seen on the film. It's our city expo in 2022. And uh, we, are, um, we are getting there and uh, we are now out in the world looking for smart and innovative ideas that we're going to take home to Helsingborg and uh, create them there. And uh, for me, it's a, a smart city is an innovative, uh, sustainable city with a low foot, uh, carbon footprint and with a high quality of life. <laughs> uh, and I have some examples for you what uh, we have done in Helsingborg so far. And um, we have... Um, we don't like to wait for the state to tell us uh, how we're going to do things. We, we like to try to do things ourselves and test them and not uh, have so long plans because uh, plans tend to be old when uh, we want to act. So uh, we have created uh, our own climate and energy plan. And uh, we have the plan to become uh, climate neutral in 2035. And uh, we think that it's possible. And uh, to show uh, how we're going to uh, do it, um, one example is uh, that we have created our own uh, climate change program for transports for our own employees. We have about uh, 10,000 employees in the municipal. So um, uh, when, we f when we take a fly, uh, we put a fee on 50% on the ticket uh, cost, and then I take those money uh, to me, and I uh, give uh, the employees free uh, train and bus transports instead. <laughs> so we push from flight to uh, train and, uh, and bus. And uh, we have discovered that our employees, uh, they, uh, they have rediscovered the train because they think it's a, good, it, it's a good place to work at. And um, we, have so far, uh, we have so far lowered the uh, flight uh, with 30% uh, due to uh, this, the, uh, the previous year. 
so this is an example that we can uh, how we can uh, do an impact uh, directly and um, we have uh, we have always uh, look at our our waste and uh, and figured how we're going to do with it and um, we have an, an eight fraction uh, sorting um, an eight fraction uh, sorting at the households near the households and we think that's the only way to do it because uh, if you don't do it at the households, you always get uh, a worse results. So uh, as close as, as possible to the households. And uh, many of those products in, uh, have a value in Sweden. So paper is value in uh, to recycle, and uh, metals and glass and carbon board and so on. The toughest one has been uh, perhaps uh, plastic. Uh, but we discover new products all the time, and now we have discovered uh, a kind of uh, a liner between the rails uh, that we sell, that we sell to, our, to our rail companies, and uh, it's been a success. And uh, the food waste, uh, we take it, we um, we collect it, and we digest it into methane, and then we drive our buses, our public transport with it. Um, we are now testing another, another thing on uh, the waste disposal. It's uh, disposal on demand. And uh, you have a bottom uh, on the waste bin, and when it's full, you push the bottom, and a signal goes to, um, to the company, to the waste company, and they, uh, they drive out to fetch your bin. And uh, we are testing it in a residential area, and we have now uh, low with the transports with 30% since we started this project. Um, and we're also building a new residential area where we are testing uh, a new water waste system. Uh, so we have these vacuum toilets for less uh, water consump consumption. And then we separate um, the gray water, black water, and the food. Uh, and we take the black water and the food and we digest it into methane again and uh, we use it in, uh, as I said, in public transports. And um, these are some examples that uh, we do in Helsingborg, and uh, it's examples that every city can do if they just uh, have the ambition to it, I think. This is incredibly exciting. Uh, one thing I was discussing with the ambassador this morning, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Sweden as a country has been so successful in implementing the circular economy, particularly waste to energy, that it's now importing waste, uh, looking to import waste, uh, because it's run out of its own waste, so it's happy to take others' waste, uh, which is very welcome at the moment, as I believe China begins to decrease the amount of, uh, uh, of waste that it's taking from cities here in the United States, like Los Angeles. Yes, I heard it. Uh, I was in Alex Alexandria yesterday, and they said that uh, China don't take any more of the, of the waste there, so that they have to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in Sweden, we um, we have yes, we import uh, waste, but uh, I think it's a it's a part of the tax in Europe because uh, it's uh, you can't uh, put organic uh, waste on a landfill in Sweden. Uh, it's forbidden, so. Uh, and it's uh, the same in uh, in Europe, and it takes uh, other steps. So it it, it creates a, a market for for waste. Uh, but uh, we think that the solution is always to to collect the waste uh, close to the to the to the household, and then recycle it. Because if you if you put it together, it's almost uh, it it's not so good to take it from there. Local solutions and local yeah. innovation always better. Yes, we might not be better. looking for the, the globalization of waste just yet. <laughs> uh, Lisa, let's, let's turn to you now, uh, an, an American city, but one which, which is very internationally oriented. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you're a part of the, uh, the International Urban Cooperation Program that links certain US cities with cities in the EU. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? What's Baltimore's role in that? And, and, uh, and, and how has that, that, that set of international cooperation gone for you so far? Um, so Baltimore does have, a, we work a lot with different cities. Um, we have a partnership, a sister city with Rotterdam, like Baltimore, they mm -hmm. are a large port city, um, also a legacy city. 
um, where the, the, industri the industrial sector has shrunk um, over the years. Uh, we work with the German Marshall Fund. We work with an urban transitions alliance with other legacy cities in Europe and in, a in China and the United States. We find this very valuable. We, um, the, the kinds of challenges that Baltimore faces are, are as a, we're a town of 600,000. Uh, I know a lot of you are from DC. You may or may not have visited the city um, in a while. Some of the challenges that, um, that, that are faced by the cities in Europe and other places that we work with are, are ones that we share with, with a few others in the US. So um, safety, the, the shrinking population, Baltimore's lost 400,000 um, residents from our peak. And so we have, depending on how you count it, 40 to 50,000 vacant lots or buildings. Um, we have, um, we see the scars of racial inequity in our city um, on a daily basis from the redlining that you may have heard about from white only, whites only covenants that had been in place and that were actually started in Baltimore, unfortunately. Um, and, um, you know, we look then to try to put equity at the front of the work that we do. And we find that um, working internationally is, uh, you know, is a way to, for us to learn um, other tools and, and ways to, to, to take those steps forward to redress those issues and to ensure that as we work on sustainability that we see um, progress that is uh, more equitable and that um, you know, take you know that that helps us um, address all three you know sort of areas of sustainability, not just environment, but the social justice and the economic. Um, Baltimore is one of the most racially segregated cities in the United States. Um, it is one of the only independent, one of the few independent cities, which means that we're not part of a county, which has left the city. Um, that second part has left us um, with, with uh, fewer resources to, to address some of the things, but we do still try to take steps um, that we think work for us. Um, as, um, so one of the things that we're doing are community resiliency hubs. So the, as a, my office um, does both the sustainability and climate action planning on the mitigation side, but also the hazard mitigation planning, the adaptation. Um, and so these community resiliency hubs are kind of at the overlap of that, where we work not with city building, but with trusted community partners to set up locations where these are groups that are already active in their community. They already act as a resource. Um, and we as a government are just connecting them to resources in the, in the city that they would need to um, work with after an emergency or a disaster, but also do some you know, um, centralized fundraising for, say, the solar panels and the battery, batteries for the buildings or supplies that they may need. Um, we're hoping to launch them officially this summer. Um, I will, I'm not, hopefully we will launch them. Uh, I'm not hopeful with the reason why, which is just that we would launch them as cooling centers during code red day. So I'm hoping it's, that we don't have as much of that this summer. Um, but um, these are um, the kinds of, uh, conversations that we have that we know um, other cities, both in the United States and internationally, are also having and uh, uh, look forward to venues like these to have further conversations about them. Terrific. Thank you. And let, let me just ask as a quick add-on, you, you're also a pretty young city. You've got Johns Hopkins University, you, you've got, you know, you, you've, you've got a lot of university-age students living in the Baltimore area. Um, how does that shape the way you engage with, uh, with citizens and, and the, l the way you think about the sort of projects that you're going to undertake? Um, it's interesting. My first thought was, well, we were formed in 17-something, which, <laughs> which I know relative to counterparts here is still a young city. But, um, you know, you are right. Um, and it's, um, I, I came from higher education before this job. It's a... Um, when we did our sustainability plan, we did a very intensive uh, and, and broader communication, community engagement than we had done in the past. And a lot of our focus was on trying to make sure that we reached populations that we didn't normally talk to. So we were aiming, for example, as we did these one-on-one -on -one surveys, wanted to 
uh, match the demographics of the cities. And we didn't get the 68% African American, we got closer to 47, but we did manage to hear more from the youth in the city. Uh, we did match the demographics age-wise in that conversation, and it, we did get some different results. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the, who we talked to, though, was probably a combination of, of people who are, who are in the city um, to come to university or one of the, you know, whether it's John Hopkins or some of the other uh, um, colleges in the city, um, but also um, African American uh, youth in East and West Baltimore who are maybe, maybe are, have been, you know, were born in the city and, and plan to stay in the city. Um, you know, one, one aspect that, one answer that we got in that survey that uh, we didn't expect was um, we asked people what they liked most and least about their neighborhood. Um, not surprisingly, the answer we got the most across uh, uh, the different groups was their neighbors. Um, the answer, and this was not a statistically significant one for the, the data folks in the room, um, but the one we got most common from youth was um, noise. They either liked or did not like the noise in their neighborhood. Um, we are still exploring what that means. Um, we think that it's not what maybe, um, you know, someone like me who, you know, is a little bit older and, and further away from that of like, oh, it's those pesky kids making noise. We think it has more to do with public safety in the city, that, that youth in um, some of these communities are more likely to hear, they're gonna be, there's gonna be more police and ambulance presence. They're going to be, uh, their houses are closer to the street and their windows may be more likely to be open if it's in the summer and they don't have air conditioning and so they hear that a lot more and what that means for them. Um, but it does mean that we also, I could rattle off my Facebook and social media um, examples as well, but we're also then cognizant of the di digital divide in the city. And so it, it, that question, we end up having to kind of look at it both in the expected way and then I think in the way of um, coming from the, the inequities, inequities in the city. Absolutely, and in, in your in pointing out the duality of the the meaning of uh, or the term young city, uh, it reminds me as well that we should be you know, cognizant of that distinction between uh, our partners on the other side of the Atlantic and in, in in Europe and ourselves. Uh, uh, having spent time in Oxford, having spent time in Bologna, cities like that, I, I'm cognizant of the fact that a uh, a city which is simply geriatric in U.S. terms, one which has been around since you know si since. Uh, uh, the founding times of the U.S. is just going through puberty in Europe. I mean, it's really a relatively young city in a European context. Um, in addition, though, there let's let's zoom out even beyond the U.S. and the EU, and remember that in addition there are differences uh, between the cities in the transatlantic space and some of the fastest growing cities of the world, which are nowhere to be found uh, in North America and nowhere to be found in in Europe. Um, instead, there. Are they're, they're in other exciting places around the world. It's, it's, it's Lagos, it's Jakarta, it's, it's uh, cities that are struggling with all the challenges that we mentioned here today, but on steroids, because the growth is so significant, the population is burgeoning. Um, a, a few facts just to, to, to frame some of this discussion. More than half the world's population is under 30 years old. When you talk about a place like the Middle East, that number goes up to 65% of the Middle East population is under 30 years old. In India, there are more than 300 million Indians under the age of 15. It means that every month until 2030, every single month, one million Indians will turn 18. One million Indians will turn 18 that are looking for jobs, that are looking for quality and sustainable housing, that are looking for livable communities, right? And that's just in one country. Nigeria has the youngest population in the world, right? To, to take another continent or another example of a large country on, on, on another continent. So I, I mention all this because Axel, I, I want to turn to you and I want to obviously zoom out and get a little bit more of a global take from everything you've heard here today. Uh, how does this translate into the, the Mexico cities, the Lagoses, the, the Jakartas, the Shanghais of the world? Um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that, that you're seeing uh, in, in developing countries, in, in, uh, in, in burgeoning megacities there, uh, and, and how does that differ a little bit from the transatlantic context? Um, um, 
Thanks, David. From a global perspective, I think the one um, 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 yeah, thing to keep in mind is that um, basically urbanization is practically finished um, in, in the US and the EU, and 90% of um, a new urban population will be added in developing country context. So um, uh, that means um, that basically two billion people will um, two billion additional people will live in cities by um, 2040, 2050. And that translates, um, and that I think is a very important fact, into a, a, an almost tripling of the urban build-up environment and footprint. Um, so by the year 2030 even, you will have built the, the same amount of urban build-up area that existed in 2000 by the year to, um, 2030. So the, the amount of, 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 of urban expansion that's happening right now in the developing world is, is absolutely staggering. And I think if you sort of try to step back and, and, and try to distinguish the most critical differentiating factor between the challenges in the, US, in the EU and the US, it is really the, um, the, the fact that that the cities are, are being built as we speak, and the way they are being built has a massive impact on the sustainability question. In very simple terms, are in developing are developing countries developing more in let's say the U.S. suburbanized, low density types of type of model, or in more the European higher density, more compact urban form uh, model? And and depending on where we're coming out on these two models. Uh, the challenge of sustainability will be vastly different. It's almost impossible to provide, for example, public transport in low density urban environments. And so if cities in developing countries are developing in a low density form, it is practically impossible to provide what's necessary to, for sustainability, public transport just being one example. So I think um, um, uh, that is really, really important to keep in mind. And what's also keeping uh, important to keep in mind, basically urban, cities only urbanize, or countries only urbanize once. So once you're, you're stuck with your footprint, you're stuck with it. It's, uh, the urban form is the longest lived asset in an economy. Um, normal infrastructure, let's say water, city, water systems, they last for 40 years, but urban, for the urban form, you're talking about hundreds of years. So it's a one-shot game ultimately, and so what we are seeing a lot is, is, is these, these, these mega cities, but not just mega cities, but a lot of secondary cities or even smaller cities just expanding and not unfortunately expanding in the way we'd like to see it, which is in more compact urban ways, um, in, 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 in urban forms that, that would uh, support a, a transit-oriented development, et cetera. So I think in terms of, the uh, number one challenge from an urban point of view, uh, that is really it. And the uh, sort of other key differentiating factor is that a lot of the, the cities in the global south are, are tasked to address the sustainable uh, challenges at a level of income that's, that's just a fraction of, 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 of what exists in the US and uh, in Europe, of course. And so the challenges are just really staggering um, how to promote sustainability when you're income levels are so low, and then in some region, and you've mentioned the uh, Middle East, you have a massive uh, youth bulge that's entering the, the labor market that's looking for a job. And so in terms of relative priorities, uh, there's clearly an equation on, is it really the jobs that matters, or is it the sort of sustainability equation that matters most at this point in time? So the context is, is, is obviously different, um, um, and um, yeah, the, the challenges are, are, are staggering. Absolutely, and, and as you mentioned, it's so true. Cities and infrastructure are in many ways truly the physical embodiment of policy choices that we're making today and policy choices that were made long ago. Um, and so the you know decisions which seem kind of to lack a certain materiality to them will become physically embodied in the, in the places we live in in 10, 20, 30 years time hence. Um, let me turn to uh, it, let me turn to close to home to Washington D.C. Uh, uh, but but before I do that, let me also remind everyone that uh, uh, we're gonna. I, I want to uh, throw in questions from the audience throughout this, not just at the end. So I'll go to the audience right after I ask uh, Daniel a question. So if you have a question, please um, start thinking of it, and uh, and I'll turn to you right after this. Um, Daniel, tell us a little bit more just uh, about 
DC has a variety of different long-term plans, which are really impressive uh, for a city of any size. When it comes to clean energy, when it comes to climate resilience, um, you've just set up a green bank. Guide us through a little bit uh, of the kind of the litany of different programs that you have going on um, and, and what it's been like to develop those. Yep. Um, under the leadership of Mayor Bowser here in DC, she committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. Now it's our role to figure out actually how to do that. So we're trying to come up with a host of programs to make sure that we're successful here. Um, by 2032, we're supposed to cut our greenhouse gas emissions in half. By 2032, we're supposed to have all renewable sources of, of energy here in DC. Um, one of the mechanisms that we've set up in place in, to, to figure this out is the DC Green Bank. Um, we're looking at, potent, at having our first host of uh, products out um, in the spring or winter of 2020. Um, that will look like long loss reserves, looking at gap financing to finance products that your traditional lending institutions may not be used to lending to. So, and we hope that, um, you know, that will actually loosen up funding for surrounding jurisdictions and financial institutions, you know, for the mayor um, from Seat Pleasant as well, so that they have access to additional lending. Um, we currently have, um, we just got back from a delegation not too long ago. I want to emphasize the importance um, of Sister C relationships here as well. Um, we took 30 developers, um, utilities, and upper level government staff to Copenhagen and Brussels over the course of five days. Um, and it's tough enough to get all of these people in a room for an hour to discuss an issue, much less five days, um, to absorb, uh, you know, different technologies in different countries. So the fact that uh, the House of Sweden and the ambassador is opening their doors here, I want to applaud them because I can't emphasize enough about the importance of cities collaborating and learning from one another um, around technologies and everything that we're doing. We have seen a dramatic impact from that delegation through the Clean Energy DC Omnibus Bill. Um, the Clean Energy DC Omnibus Bill, Mayor Bowser signed into law in January. Um, what that does is it looks, it does a lot of things, but we know here in DC that 75% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. So the, that is where we're going to make up the largest gains uh, here. So what are we going to do? Part of the, the bill has building energy performance standards in it to where we will cut greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings by 20%. Um, looking at a net zero energy code in 2022 for residential buildings, um, and then looking at 2026 for all commercial buildings. So just thinking about the impact that has um, on DC and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, um, it, it goes such a long way. So we're trying to work um, as, as fast as we can to um, you know, get to these aggressive goals that, that Mayor Bowser has committed to for the district. Um, so with that, uh, she has, uh, it's very important to have a lens of equity associated with that so that everyone can participate. Looking at uh, community solar, so how can low income residents actually participate in this as well? How can buildings put up solar on the buildings, uh, issue subscriptions to low income residents so that you can lower their bills as well um, so that everyone can participate? Um, uh, as we all work together here. Um, but that, that's just a few, I could go on and on about the programs that we have, but really um, it take every opportunity we can to, to sit and have these conversations with groups like this in other cities across the world. That's terrific, and um, uh, DC's really become a laboratory of policy innovation when it comes to these issues. Um, I'm sure we also have a lot of DC residents in the audience, uh, as I myself am. So why don't we uh, why don't we see if there are any audience questions? Pull a few in from there before we continue our discussion. Uh, uh, whether you have questions for anyone, and I think we probably have a roaming mic, uh, so we'll go to the the gentleman uh, right here in the middle row. 
Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll collect three questions, actually. We'll go to the gentleman right here in the middle row, um, uh, and the two ladies over here on this side of the room. Thank you. Uh, Richard Jordan, I'm the Dean of NGO Reps at the UN. Uh, since you're working on probably energy retrofits uh, in DC, the last, sorry, New York Ranger, Stanley Cup goal winning um, uh, goalkeeper, Mike Richter, is doing that in New York. Are you working with star athletes who may be interested in pitching in? Thank you. Interesting. So why don't we take uh, two more questions. We've got uh, two that were, two hands that were up on this side. Um, but that's a great question, and I'll throw in as well. I think a former Pittsburgh Steeler has also started an energy services company as well. So maybe there's something about uh, retired athletes and energy services. Hi, Please. this is wonderful. Um, I'm Dr. Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services USA. And obviously, we're interested in young people and the future. So for our city representatives, what are you doing with the schools, particularly the public schools, in getting the young people to think about these questions? Are you working with teachers, the teachers' unions, to develop curricula? Are you bringing in experts from real live programs to catalyze interest? This is really important to get the young people and their teachers aboard on this. Absolutely, so a question about education. And did we have one more? If you wanted to, raise your hand to the front. Yeah, we had one more question uh, uh, right there in the front row. States of Mind, a non-profit organization. Uh, my question is more for the gentleman who represents the DC. Um, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on what is Green Bank? Mm -hmm. Great, so um, why don't we quickly, yeah, why don't we answer on Green Bank and then we'll take, take the other two questions uh, with whoever wants to field those. So our Green Bank is capitalized at $105 million over the course of five years. We're looking at a um, rate of return of five to one or seven to one with private investment, looking at foundations um, to also invest in this. The first round of products, as I mentioned earlier, will be rolled out in spring um, or winter of 2020. Um, what that would look like is the district or the Green Bank, it's a quasi-governmental um, entity that doesn't have the procurement laws of the district government, so it can move dollars much faster. It's much more flexible, much more nimble to um, uh, respond to the market. What are the needs? Like, what projects need gap financing? How can the Green Bank take on some of the risk of issuing uh, low-interest loans? Um, so, so looking at ways, we're, we know that we have aggressive environmental goals and we currently don't have the budget to implement that. So we all know it's much easier when you show up to the table and you've got some money. So how do we get into these projects, these large track development sites in D.C. Um, that are being developed right now? We, we work with the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development to say, hey, we have resources available now. Let's start working some of this language into RFPs. So when this goes out the door, it's already baked in and we're not trying to work against the stream here um, to, to incorporate you know, net zero building right now even before these codes start. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to talk with you more about that, um, about the Green Bank and the goals. But the, those, those are the basics uh, and just of a, what we're trying to accomplish. A quick follow-up question there. From my experience, one of the challenges that any Green Bank faces um, uh, in this sort of context is figuring out the difference between uh, opportunities where taking that first little tranche of risk capital unlocks a, a, a tremendous opportunity, <laughs> crowds in a lot of investment that's just waiting for, for a player to take some, you know, some part of the capital stack that'll unlock a lot of other uh, financial players. Uh, on that on the one hand, which is pretty much what you're looking for, right? Yeah. That's, your, that's your nirvana. But on the other hand, you don't want to get stuck in, in what might look like that opportunity, but turns out to be an area that private capital wasn't financing for good reason, right? Yeah. Uh, any thinking on uh, how you navigate those challenges? Well, we put a lot of work into, you know, we're, we're trying to get the bank stood up right now, but we're doing as much work as we can so that we hand over studies of potential products 
and what would be the, um, you know, the, the what you get the most bang for your buck so that they, they can roll out initially once the board is in place and executive director is um, in place that we want to be successful right out of the gate. So what is the host of products that um, will make the bank successful um, as soon as it comes out of the gate? You know, we, we want to um, make sure that low-income communities can, can participate with this, but we have to make sure that it is established right out of the gate and then start working in some of those products. But from the departments, um, yeah, so I, I think we, we're trying to do as much work as we can right now um, with consultants and giving documents over to the board of directors so that they can make the right decisions as, as quickly as possible as soon as it's launched. Absolutely. Um, okay, and then whether it's D.C., Baltimore, Helsingborg, uh, what are we doing on civic education um, to ensure that that you know we're not reliving some of the same uh, some of the same mistakes of the past, and that, that that future generations, as they rise into into becoming citizens and ultimately leaders, um, are better equipped to to tackle the sustainability challenges we're going to face. So I can share um, some of what we're doing in the city of Baltimore. We've had a program in place for many years. It's kind of been two-pronged. One is giving small grants to schools, like $1,000 or $2,000, which is often um, can be really, uh, you know, to, and it, it's for a rain, it's for anything the schools kind of want within that field. So they sometimes add composting at their schools. They've added community gardens uh, as an educational tool. I think sometimes they've developed, you know, uh, modules for their classes. Um, and, and we worked with a community foundation um, and a coordinator at the school um, in our office to do that. But we also had um, a, a interns. We thought it was important to um, have interns from the high schools um, to work on issues. And, and the first cohort that we had wanted to tackle legislative issues. And so they worked for many years. They won a Brower, two of them won Brower Awards, which is a national prize given every year, um, for work to uh, ban styrofoam. So many people heard that, um, you know, Maryland's state legislature passed a styrofoam ban. We know that Montgomery County and I think Prince George's County also had bans. City of Baltimore also passed one a year ago. And it was really, um, we know it was because of the youth voice on that issue, the council president said it was, um, that it was, that was what changed his mind, that, that we had these students, and this was actually not just high school students who were involved at that point in terms of, of doing that outreach. But one of the things I just wanted to mention that, that we're looking into is, some of you may or may not have heard of the Enoch Pratt Public Libraries in Baltimore. Uh, they recently won a national competition as one of the nicest places in the U.S. Um, they're phenomenal libraries, they take this just very expansive view of what a library can be and where it where it exists. Um, so for example, they have a mobile job uh, vehicle. So they take the library out to people. Um, this is kind of uh, referencing back to the digital divide that I mentioned of people not always having access either to computers or to the Wi-Fi to, to access the internet. Um, but they're out there um, helping people, you know, write resumes and get connected to jobs. Um, they're in laundromats. They have um, programming that is timed to the length of a wash cycle. So they go to where people are to, to share the resources of the library. And we're looking to sort of to, to add in information on sustainability there. Um, this would be um, not just solely youth focused, but we view that as, as part of uh, our mandate. Great. And, um, and, and what about on, uh, on education or on, on sports? Um, I don't know if Helsingborg has a competitive uh, sporting environment, maybe a very good hockey team, perhaps, I don't know. But uh, whether it's the Ravens or the Capitals or, or the, the Nationals or whoever it might be, what, is there more that we think can be done or, or what's being done to engage some of the more charismatic uh, aspects of our cities, which regardless of whether we're sports fans or not, are often sports teams? Um, what role do they have to play on, on elevating sustainability issues in the public mind? Uh, we have in Helsingborg a good uh, soccer team, mm. and uh, there we have uh, we we try to take those uh, players and uh, 
they show the schools uh, how to sort uh, waste and uh, they, they, we, we try to have them as uh, profiles in our environmental uh, work and it's uh, it's a good work so it's it's functioning excellent that's good and uh, anything with the, the caps or the nats or we we have a very good working relationship with the nationals here um, we have a mascot called Anna the Shad. It's an American shad. We're trying to um, bring awareness of the local fishery here in D.C. And she was out running with the presidents um, the other day. Teddy actually caught Anna the Shad. And uh, so that was pretty fun at the baseball stadium. But we're, we're open. If anybody has any relationships, we're always trying to elevate the, the work that we're doing. So please, bring on the stars. <laughs> I think it's important uh, that we not only celebrate our successes, but in a venue like this, we can also, uh, you know, um, be be quite be quite frank and sober about the challenges that you're all facing. Um, if I could have you briefly, maybe go down the line, and and and, and starting with you, Henrik, what are what, what are some of the most uh, enduring challenges that you face, or perhaps another way, and a more interesting way of framing it, is what keeps you up at night. Um, I think this when I uh, have my meetings with the uh, economy people in this in the city uh, we have uh, lots of uh, more younger people and uh, we have an elderly uh, older people so and, and and we have the same tax uh, payers so we have to be more efficiency in the municipal and uh, I think we in Sweden have to be better in um, getting the inhabitants to do things for the society that uh, earlier had been uh, funded by tax. So that's one of the issues that we are working on. Let me just ask a follow-up question there, because one, one of the things you told me is that there was a, there's a political consensus, you said, behind uh, the, the sustainability measures that are being taken in your city. I think that's a really interesting to note, and I'll contrast that with the or, or complement that at least by noticing that one of the one of the young women in the videos that started off today um, called for something beyond just technocratic solutions. Um, what was the process of getting that political consensus, and what's the source of that political consensus? Do you think is it driven by uh, is it driven by a moral imperative? Is it driven by a recognition that? taking a lot of these sustainability and circular economy measures is actually going to be good for the economy and reduce costs as well. well tell us a little bit more about how that political consensus came to be. Yeah, uh, we have what we call a life quality program in Helsingborg. And uh, in that program we gather uh, issues as uh, economical, social, environmental and health issues. And uh, t uh, forget it to work in a, in a city we have to have all the um, political parties with us because other it uh, doesn't work. So it was a, it was a long process for uh, several years before we came to this uh, decided uh, life quality program. But uh, it was worth it uh, because now everyone is a part of it. So we can move forward. Um, I mentioned some of Baltimore's challenges. I wanted to hit on two, one of which is not quite to the level of keeping me up at night, but I think it is a, a very systemic problem in the city of, of getting people to the jobs. Um, even in an era of full employment, uh, a nationwide average, we have significant pockets of the city where unemployment, uh, especially among young and, and African American men, is you know, 20, 30, 40%. Um, and um, you know, you actually, you mentioned that cities only get to urbanize once. You know, we actually, there is an opportunity for Baltimore in the vacants and in the population loss because we, we have areas of the cities that went from higher density that are now lower density that don't support public transportation that can get people to jobs. But we, we are trying to think about how it is that we can, I don't want to say re-urbanize because that sounds like the government doing it to the communities, but, but how we can work in community development to, um, you know, to, to really address that. I mean, the, the statistic that sticks with me is that in the Baltimore area, people with access a car, to a car can get to 100% of the jobs in under 60 minutes, which is still a long commute, maybe not by DC standards. Um, of the people who don't have access to a car, they can only get to 9% of the jobs in under 60 minutes reliably. Um, and, and 
So at that area, at that intersection of sort of public transit, uh, the economy, and uh, the vacant housing and, uh, that we have is both a significant challenge and an opportunity. What keeps me up more at night is related more to the climate adaptation. Um, again, many of you in the area know about the flash flooding that is common in the mid-Atlantic area. We have areas in Baltimore where that is a, a real issue. We have, we have building codes in that are helping us be more resilient from a built environment point of view to that. Um, we do not have the flood warning systems that we need in place. Um, that is something we are looking for. We um, and looking at that from a smart city perspective of how we can, um, these are very flashy streams as they say. Um, uh, but also kind of back to I think many people, I think this, this statistic just got updated by the Federal Reserve, the, the percentage of people in the country who could not come up with $400 in an emergency without going into debt, that is 40%. Um, I worry about the, the confluence of those things, uh, of, of disasters, natural disasters hitting the city of Baltimore, you know, and how many people in our city you know, face that. Um, I read an article that when Katrina hit in New Orleans, there's a hypothesis that the human toll was made worse. There's no studies on this, uh, the, the number, but that um, it was near the end of the month. And so there was an assumption or a hypothesis that there may have been even more people who could not come up with that, you know, that amount of money that was needed to evacuate from the city and what that may have done, and that's something that I really worry about in our city. Um, from my perspective, um, it is really the tension between the sustainability and all the other things people worry about in the developing world, getting a job, getting out of poverty, et cetera, and how to give the prominence to the sustainability agenda that's so important for climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and so on, in a, in a world that is most immediately dominated by, by very immediate um, 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 and other concerns and, and really getting that equation right that basically development is about sustainability and sustainability is about development, which which can be done but it's not always obvious. And and then in that context, how to finance obviously the, the massive amount of investments that's uh, required um, to provide sustainable infra infrastructure in a world where we know that some, as David, you were saying, some, some of the areas clearly are attractive for the private sector but a lot of the areas on sustainabilities um, have more of a public good character and public resources are scarce. So how can we work basically with countries, with cities to sort of create fiscal and financial space on the public side and then also crowd in the private sector where appropriate. So in initiatives like the Greenback in DC are very, very interesting and we're looking in, into these things also in our uh, country contexts. Is that, uh, if you had to choose the the financial mechanism that you're most excited about, uh, what would it be? Um, we, we didn't touch on financial mechanisms quite as much as I would have liked, but, but, but maybe just quickly, uh, some that we, you know, we, we discussed green banks, but, but Axel, what are the others that we should be keeping our eyes on that, uh, that the bank is involved in or that you're very excited about? Well, unfortunately, there's not the, the one or the magic wand um, in, 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 that, in that field. I think from a city's perspective, uh, and that's kind of only partially answering your question, what is really important is to get the city finances in order. And I think DC, again, is a fantastic case study, which we're using, by the way, also globally, where a city that was essentially bankrupt 20 years ago started getting back on its fees by getting the finances in order by basically um, working towards getting a credit rating, issuing a bond, and demonstrating basically that the city is financially capable again to get basically on top of its many problems. And that was the first order of um, uh, a business, uh, in a sense, getting that uh, in place. And I think that's, that's a big lesson, and that's what we're trying to do with cities, working on their finances, on their credit worthiness, et cetera, so that the city can go out and borrow, uh, not just for commercially viable projects, but for public good type of projects. On the um, innovations, um, on sort of project-based financing, um, um, I think uh, we're using a lot of financial intermediary uh, approaches, working with banks to, for example, on land uh, for building energy efficiency programs that I think are very attractive because we get the scale um, through working through local capital markets in order to, yeah, basically retrofit um, 
uh, buildings to make them energy more efficient. I think that's a, 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 a model that could be rolled out in other sectors, subsectors as well. Terrific. And Daniel, I'll give you the last word. Uh, biggest challenge that, that DC faces? Biggest challenge DC that you faces. Face in the that you face in your role. DC may, have, may be facing a lot of challenges. Luckily, you're not paid to deal with I, all of them. You know, I think that we have a very progressive development community here in DC. Um, we're very fortunate for that. Um, we, developers know how to buy parcels of land, build buildings, sell them, and make money. I think we're trying to change the culture of development here in DC. How do you make a business case for buying land, building a building, making it net zero, and making sure that that is profitable? And we, I think, slowly, we're doing that. We have an example of the, the AGU, American Geophysical Union building, which is one of the first net, uh, net zero retrofits um, in DC to where we use that as a demonstration project to take developers, to take engineers, to take architects, mm -hmm. to show that this is possible in DC. Like, and if you start planning early, it, it, it doesn't cost that much more. And we're trying to work, you know, with, um, to make sure that the assessments are actually reflecting the value of these buildings, working with insurance companies. So I think, you know, the biggest challenge that, that we have is really changing the culture of development here in D.C. But I, I think we're, we're moving, you know, down the road because of, you know, the delegation, things like that, sharing, making sure that we're engaging the, the right folks. We have a great partner in uh, DCBIA, Building Industry Association here in D.C., Lisa Mallory. Um, has been right by our side um, through the omnibus bill and went on the delegation with us. So I think working with our partners, our associations, and our development community to make sure that we're educating everybody so they have all the information up front so when they're developing buildings that, it, that it's done in the right way. And we're proud of it, you know, 20 years down the road. Terrific. This has been a great discussion. Um, I wasn't even aware going in how many different linkages there were going to be between cities, uh, financial institutions, between, uh, you know, places which might be thousands of miles apart but are, but are right next to one another in terms of the challenges they're facing and the solutions that they're looking at. So with that, please uh, join me in thanking this wonderful first panel. Thank you very much. And let me welcome up our, our second panel to the stage. I am not happy about what has been done to this planet, and that's why we are here. We are striving, striving for the climate, and this is because we don't we don't think that the politician is doing enough to fill the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement tells us that we have to act now, and this is not the reality. Our demands is sticking to the Paris Agreement, following it every step, sticking to the IPCC report and sticking to it every step. We unite behind science because we need a strong voice in this movement. This crisis is global and if we want to find solutions to the immigration problem and to the droughts and to the starvation and avoid future wars, we need to solve the climate change. We won't stop until we feel that the world, the cities and the countries have listened to us and are acting upon this crisis. We won't stop until the future is safe. The climate crisis is the whole world's problem. We need to work together to fix it. Not just Denmark, not just the US, not just Sweden, not just India. The whole world needs to rise together and help each other to solve this climate crisis that we're in right now. No, 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 no. No! All right, so our final panel of the day, uh, and perhaps uh, the, the most, uh, most wide-ranging and, uh, and exciting one in, in many ways, because we're talking about planning the cities of the future. 
Um, let me briefly introduce our, our panel, uh, starting by the, the far end of this row. Uh, Manuel Perez Romero is founding partner at Nodo 17 Group. He's also a professor at the Instituto, Instituto de Empresa in Spain, IE in Spain. Um, uh, next to him, uh, Chuck Bean is executive director for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Um, so I'm sure we'll have some really interesting kind of uh, synthesis uh, perspectives on the multiple different uh, size cities that we've heard from today in the area. Um, Mina Marafat is adjunct lecturer uh, at SCS MPS Urban and Regional Planning um, at Georgetown University, program at Georgetown University. And uh, finally, to my immediate left is Ate Rihela, uh, project manager at Intelligent Urban Transportation at Rumble. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, let, me, let me start off with you, Chuck, just because I think uh, you'll provide a, uh, an interesting kind of capstone to, to like I said, uh, for everywhere from, from Sea Pleasant to, you know, to Baltimore to Washington. Um, how do you work with cities of very different sizes, uh, sometimes with shared challenges, sometimes with very different scale and, and nature of challenges? Um, and how do you do that particularly when their views of sustainable growth might diverge or might not be perfectly aligned? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. I think um, to get started, I'm going to pick up on a theme from your last panel, and that is about youngness. And uh, what can we learn from the, our experience? And uh, what have we done well? What could we be doing better? And, and the, the youngest I'm referring to is in, in 1930, in this whole region, there lived about 800,000 people. So now there are about 5.8 million people. So 5 million people have been added just in the last uh, 90 years. And did we do that all really well? Um, in some cases, we did well. In some cases, we didn't. Um, and it has to do, I think, with uh, different interests in the District of Columbia. And our members are in Maryland, uh, Montgomery, and Prince George's, Frederick Charles, and then also, also Northern Virginia. So there's some great uh, examples of transit-oriented development in Arlington, as you look right across the river here, as the metro was built from Roslyn out to, out to Boston. But there's also some challenges of sprawl, as uh, you add 5 million people in, in, in 90 years. Um, you know, we had the District of Columbia as the, as the core here, um, but then World War II, uh, Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, Prince George's, Montgomery, all doubled in the 40s. Then they all doubled again in the 50s, and some of them doubled again in the 60s. Um, the district population declined from uh, 800,000 people down to about 500,000 people. Climbing back up, as you heard from the, the last panel. I think in 2010, there were 600,000 people in the district. Now there are 700,000 people in the district. So I think we are, are re-urbanizing. But I, I hope that we can get to a con connection between transportation, housing, and sustainability in a, maybe a next, next question. Um, but as I, as I warm up to that, since 2000 in our region, half of all the housing has been in the outer suburbs, so really not uh, on transit. Um, so half of all housing, just cheaper land, cheaper to construct, but we've got to dig ourselves out of that pickle in our planning going forward. Um, Mina, let me let me turn next to you. Uh, let's get let's go from kind of the governance level to the design level. Um, uh, as an architect, why does architecture matter? to creating the sustainable, the diverse, and the youth-inclusive cities of tomorrow? Thank you. Um, is this on? Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here and in this global community. And thank you very much for the panel uh, and the discussions this morning. I think what is very uh, significant in terms of all of the uh, the statistics that we heard uh, is that urban form also matters and architecture and the way we build buildings matter. I want to, as a historian to uh, hark back to why we are the way we are and urban sprawl is the result of a series of very uh, inadvertently uh, happen chance kind of policies that happened. After World War II, the GI Bill and the highway bill 
and the uh, housing bill and also the desegregation bill all came in within a period of one or two years from one another in the 1950s and they resulted in what we have currently urban sprawl or suburbanization as we know it today so it took a number of years but because of the large-scale development in post-world war ii we are still following the same pattern so in many ways it's it's one of the most difficult things to change the shape of urban form but it really does matter and as long as we have densities that are sprawling we will have uh, unsustainable cities and the reason why we are so different from Europe in many ways is the density and architectural pattern of for example Stockholm is uh, you know creating one-sixth the urban uh, you know carbon footprint of average cities in America so I think that the architectural form density does matter. There is a, a hopeful trend at the moment that we are moving back to, to cities and many suburbs are becoming cities. So in some ways there is uh, some hope in bringing about some densification, but I think that's where the shape of, of buildings, the performance of buildings and uh, the reuse of buildings will matter even more. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, and let me go to, to, to someone else also very involved in, uh, in the design of buildings and in, in, the de in the design of cities. Manuel, um, what is your vision for the cities of tomorrow? Um, and how do we balance uh, so many considerations over you know, how much should be invested into, um, I into, into buildings themselves? How, how do we integrate transport systems? Uh, and, and how do these design choices shape the way that we live? Well, this is a challenging question, but I, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, um, I strongly believe that uh, cities are probably one of the most complex designs ever made by human beings. Um, and one of the main characteristics of any complex uh, system is that they are, is its uncertainty. So let's say it's a kind of uncertainty, it's a kind of intrinsic, intrinsic property. So, uh, because I'm not a fortune teller, I, it's difficult for me to answer your question, but uh, I propose to look, uh, rather to look uh, to cities, try to look uh, to the natural environment. Uh, but uh, before that, we have to think about that cities is an invention of probably uh, 5,500 years old, 5,500 years old, probably the first city is Uruk, and we have, if there's nothing left from Rook right now, so it has disappeared. So we know that cities evolve our time and they change. And, and if we look uh, recently, uh, most of the theories about cities, they have failed. Uh, 100 years ago, uh, Marinetti, uh, Filippo Marinetti wrote uh, the Declaration of, of Futurism, and he said that the car was the great totem for solving any problem in cities, and after that, the modern movement divided the city like in three different parts. You have these issues that we are fighting right now against. You have the Sonian. So you have on one side where you sleep, on one side where you work, and on the other side is leisure. But everything could be connected by the car. So the car was the solution. And those theories from that time are our biggest problems right now. So trying to answer your question, uh, we need to think that uh, most of theories and look into the future is a kind of really, really difficult task. Mm -hmm. But my pr proposal is to try to understand uh, how the natural environment works and how uh, the nat living organism has been facing complexity. Um, most of them, they face complexity through adaptation and through evolution. So we can learn from them how, and we can learn from Darwin, we can learn from John Holland, how a complex adaptive system can evolve over time. And probably we can learn and we can look how they deal with the resources. One of the biggest problems of cities are the resources. What do with the lack of resources? Let's say that uh, we can look uh, to Los Angeles right now and think about what's going to happen uh, when, when the water uh, will go missing. Uh, it doesn't, no, the solution is not, is not try to find more water. The solution is to try to make a sustainable use of water. Try to reduce it and try to think that uh, 
all of us are part of the same issue and think that we, should, uh, we shouldn't spend as much water as we do. That's a kind of a statistic that is amazing, that the five-star hotel in California spend 500 liters per day per, per person. That's huge in terms of your shower, in terms of the pool, in terms of the laundry, and uh, only by taking a shower only one minute, taking, uh, not putting the towel for the laundry, you are saving water. So this is a matter of responsibility of all of us. Uh, and in the way that we are going to engage not only the stakeholders, but also all the citizens, is the way that we can build the cities of the future. Thank you. It, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of a very good Jane Jacobs quote. And of course, there's probably no better American theorist of the city than Jane Jacobs, right, who said, we expect too much of new buildings and too little of ourselves. And I think that when you look at the differences in energy consumption, energy efficiency, let's say, between many American cities and those in, in Europe, it can only partially be, be explained by the built environment. A lot of it is also the choices that we make and the, the lifestyles that we live um, worth reflecting on. Ate, let me, let, let me turn to you. Um, you work on an integral, uh, integral component of, of this, you know, this discussion over what our, what our future uh, urban environments will look like, and that's transportation. How do we get to the jobs of the future, as we were discussing on the last panel? Um, how do different modes of transportation work together? Maybe a good way to start off is by telling us a little bit about what you do and then paint a picture for us of what we should expect the European transportation system of 10 to 20 years from now to look like. Uh, yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so my work as a project manager and a transfer planner, I work a lot with uh, ar architects, uh, traffic safety, uh, site circulation planning, but also uh, researching and conducting studies with new mobility modes, such as mobility as, as a service, which was the first ever implementation in Helsinki a couple of years ago. Uh, 2018 was the last full year, or the first full year uh, of, of the uh, Mass Global's mobility as a service. And um, so cities have been, uh, uh, they've been planned for the last decades, like almost 100 years now, based on private car. That's the, uh, that's the current norm that we, when we think about city planning, that's, that's the thing in our back of our heads that we should accommodate that certain type of transportation. So, it's really dif uh, difficult to change that paradigm to something new. And these um, new uh, e-scooters that have been here, here as well, uh, they have gotten a lot, like very controversial um, uh, feedback. And um, so e-scooters, e they're like completely new mode of trans transportation. And so, it's no wonder that you know we are facing problems with them because we don't have any infrastructure for them. Um, so we have the side uh, sidewalk, and then we have the car lanes. And often in cities, um, the car lane takes up you know, 70, 80 percent of, of the space, and what's left is is the sidewalk, and the sidewalk is often accommodating uh, the bus stops, uh, the storage signs all the city furniture and so on. So uh, we reserve a lot of space for the car, which is really an inefficient way of moving around, especially in cities. Uh, car has a lot of good size as well, but uh, it's, it's really flexible on, on the uh, outside the cities. You can go uh, long, 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 uh, long distances, uh, with it and short distances, mm -hmm. but there's a catch, and the catch is that it's really bad for cities. So we need to come up a new mobility modes that can replace the demand for car. And uh, mobility as a service and these new mobility alternatives, um, 
there are the kind of first implementations of that thinking that we need to act. Uh, and in that sense, we are just practicing with them. And we need to come up with the rules and policies and the new planning guidelines, how to facilitate those new mobility modes. And uh, in, 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 in many cities around the world, it's, it's happening, but it's, it, it's a slow process. Uh, doing the guidelines, but then rebuilding it, the street, it's even longer process. So, so the transit phase is difficult one. Um, but you asked the uh, EU trans transportation system in 10 to 15 years. Mm, there's a lot of new heavy rail projects starting in, e in EU level. Uh, and right now, at least in EU level, there's the uh, uh, debate going on about the uh, about flying and should should be taxed more. So I think the long distances, uh, the uh, heavy rail will see a, a bright future. And for the cities, uh, we're slowly getting rid of cars. I don't think the cars have been banned anywhere near in 15 years, but we're accommodating more a more efficient public transportation and uh, uh, coming up with new last mile solutions, for example, with these scooters. You just touched on something which I didn't even know if I was allowed to ask. It's such a polarizing topic here in the United States, here in Washington, D.C., and it's not the White House. It's, uh, it's electric scooters. Uh, let's take that as a point of departure for talking a little bit amongst all of you about micromobility, right? This last mile solution. Um, is it here to stay? Uh, is it enriching our urban public life? Is it disrupting our, our urban uh, public life? What should we make of, uh, of micromobility, electric scooters, et cetera? Anyone who wants to take that on? Well, um, we host the transportation planning board for the region and multimodal is our middle name so I am definitely a scooter bro. I love the scooter. Um, I think any, any option, any innovation, uh, we need to have more, more and more of these disrupt, dis disruptions. I think I, I'm feeling really happy about uh, being up here on this panel. Um, you know, I don't get out of the region much so being able to learn from uh, counterparts in Europe um, we, don't, we don't have a lot of pedestrian malls in our, in our major cities, and that's probably uh, in our future. Uh, more biking, more uh, pedestrian, it's in our future, but it's, uh, it's kind of a painful process right now at the, at the, at the political level. So I think uh, more disruption, more innovation, the better. Um, I, I think that um, having multimodal means of transportation is the key to the future. Um, the automobile, uh, unfortunately, is still the major uh, mode of transportation. And as we heard some statistics about how people don't get to the job because of the last mile. So there has to be some major policy changes if we are going to address the issue of the automobile. And we, we have seen in our last five years how much Uber has disrupted the whole way in which uh, automobiles uh, relate to cities. And I think that in, in <coughs> some ways, the scooter is not as disruptive as Uber, but we, are, we, we were not prepared for Uber. We, we are yet to see the data as it relates to how it does improve and does disrupt and does damage to various sectors, including taxis, etc. But one of the things that I think that scooters show us and bicycles show us too, is that people want options. And if we provide these for them, if we include them in our urban planning, in our urban policies, to me, again, looking at the history of why we are the way we are and how we went from designing buildings that were responsive to the, to the uh, space in which they were built, to the na natural environment, to buildings that have nothing to do with the natural environment. We need to go back 
and, and learn from the history, learn from the data, but also provide options and v uh, various means of, of transportation. I think one of the key issues is bicycles w were probably one of the best modes of transportation ever invented. And in some ways, I think there are improvements to creating bicycles with motors for, you know, uh, let's say, uh, hilly, hilly cities or more el elderly population. So, but we never really address that in cities the way we did for automobiles. Mm -hmm. So I think we need think tanks. I think um, I am spending more and more time with my alumni association because I think there is a future in uh, lifelong learning, that we must learn new things and among all sectors of population. And maybe alumni associations are the key, not just universities and high schools, but new ways of educating people and new ways in which peer peer-to-peer -peer education is promoted so that we understand better how things disrupt and how things can improve our lives. Yeah, I, um, new innovations and new technologies, new mobility system, I think they need a time, a time for adaptation. And that adaptation should be done uh, not only for policymakers but from education. The, when you do urban design, uh, you cannot focus only in one type of mobility system and it's really uh, rich once that you build different layers of different system of mobility systems. So <coughs> the scooter is one that could be together with the Ubering, that could be together uh, with the metro, with the electric buses. So once that you build this kind of network of different mobility system, is once that the mobility system of a city is going to uh, get improved. And I think uh, Mina said it already, but uh, I want to point it out again that the only way is that through education. So we need, in some way, there should be uh, some policy maker that could be from high school, not only from the universities, trying to teach how to use, in a sustainable way, uh, the different mobility system. Uh, and the best one is walking or biking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm all pro scooter uh, uh, person, but there are some major issues which needs to be addressed with them. Uh, their lifespan is one to three months currently, which is like ridiculously low. Um, but then again, they just started their practice. Uh, they're, they're practicing all the time and uh, they bought uh, the ready scooter, which was uh, uh, targeted for private citizens weighing less than an average European or American uh, person weighs and not drive, you know, across the uh, uh, curbs and, and, and so on. So they're in a really, um, they face a rough treatment out there. Um, so I hope it, it's, it's get better. But the other thing is that um, if the e-scooters are replacing walking trips, it doesn't do much for the city. Uh, it needs to replace the car trips. And of course, e-scooter can't possibly replace car trips alone, but if it's a part of the public transportation system, like if it's fully implemented within the public transportation system, then it might have a chance to uh, uh, to replace some of the car trips. Excellent. Let's go to the audience. I want to make sure that we get some questions in, if there are any. Put up your hand uh, and we'll have a microphone come right by. Yeah, it looks like we've got one question here, uh, two questions actually. Um, we'll go right along the row. Hi, uh, thanks for the wonderful insights that you're producing. I noticed in traveling in Europe that they, the infrastructure there supports multimodal transportation much better than any city I've been in in the US. Uh, bicycles, uh, e-scooters, and so on have their own traffic lights, their own lanes, and uh, people are in D.C. are being killed rapidly by cars uh, trying to turn into pedestrian crossings, and we haven't dealt with that very well either. So the learning between U.S. cities and um, the infrastructure demonstrated in Europe uh, seems to be missing. What can we... What can we do about that? Okay, great. Uh, there was a question at the back as well. 
Um, but I think there was a gentleman at the back who wanted to ask a question. So this one's for Mr. Romero. I was just wondering about your concept about nature, you know? Are you like a singular voice in that area? Is it just you or is it, is it more popular? Because I thought about the same thing, look at what's already working, you know? And also the other part was, I actually forgot, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> question on nature. And then we had one question here at the front as well. Actually, two questions at the front from our, from our panelists, which is great to see. Engagement, we're learning from one another. To stick on the transportation scheme, I would be really interested in what you all think about how cities should be preparing for autonomous vehicles uh, moving in. Great question. Autonomous vehicles, uh, and then Jakob had a question as well, I think. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, it seems to me that uh, you already know the answer to the question, how the uh, transportation system in the future should look like. But the, the, the question is wrong. The question is, how to convince the people to move away from their comfort zone of having their private car to the public good of them using the, the public transportation systems or any kind of sharing, uh, economy of sharing, uh, so that uh, they don't lose the quality of their life, but with a uh, smaller environmental uh, footprint. Do you have any idea how to do this transition? I think these are terrific questions. Let me take, a, a not, maybe not all of them, but at least two or three of them and, and frame them this way. So often in what we're discussing, there's a chicken or, an, or a chicken and egg problem, um, especially when it comes to govern, the role of governments here. Do you wait until the market and your citizens show you that there's the demand for something and then you get around to planning and then eventually building for it? Or do you put in place the infrastructure trusting that the demand will be there. If you build it, will they come? Uh, in a different context, totally different from public infrastructure, no one knew that they wanted an iPod until Apple and Steve Jobs put it out into the market and told you that you needed it. And then no one knew that you needed to combine your iPod with your phone into this iPhone and that you would be okay getting rid of you know, physical buttons until Steve Jobs went and told you that it would happen. And we went from zero iPhones in the world, right, to a third of the population with smartphones in the world, to you know, a third of the population with iPhones in the world in the span of 10 or 15 years. So there are clearly some, some truths about human nature, some truths about human needs and about our desires that are out there, that, that objectively are out there. Um, and so I guess the question here is, how do you tap into those? And what's the role of governments? And do they chase the signal from citizens? Or do they, do they build it and know that citizens will come? Uh, when it comes to you know, multimodal infrastructure, when it comes to preparing for autonomous vehicles, for example. Um, what are your thoughts on that? One of the functions of my organization is to do our best to forecast housing, jobs, and uh, population going out 25 years. And uh, we work with all the planning directors to do, those, to do that modeling, and those three must go hand in hand. So that, that's gonna be my answer. Uh, where are the jobs, where are the housing, where are the population? But if I could slide in what I think is our, our big bet, um, planning for the region. And I think something happened coming out of the Great Recession that changed some mindsets about how the region grows. So our forecast had 1.5 million people coming to our region, an additional 1.5 million coming to our region. And in 2010, my board, which is mayors and council chairs, agreed that we should aspire that half of all those new people should go in what we call regional activity centers. So mixed use, on transit. Um, and that, was a, that felt like a very aspirational goal at that time. Well, each jurisdiction does their new comprehensive plan going out again and keeps getting better and better. So we've exceeded that 50%. And I'm going to be coming back to my board in the next few months that our aspiration not be just 50%, but 70% of all new population ought to be going in just 9% of the region's land mass to talk about getting at the density, I think, that, that, that you were talking about. So um, that's... Uh, that, that's, our big, that's our big bet, is that uh, we can put more and more people in smaller areas. Future transportation, I'm gonna give a plug for bus rapid transit. So the two biggest uh, population 
counties in our region are Montgomery and Fairfax, and uh, that's part of their future density around bus rapid transit Embark Richmond Highway, which is Route 1 in Fairfax, and audacious plans in Montgomery County for bus rapid transit. One of the interesting things um, I learned a lot from was uh, in, in anticipation of COP21, I interviewed 100 mayors from different parts of the world and uh, cities in America. And it would, as to how each city was responding to climate change. And the largest majority of them were, uh, in terms of analyzing the, the answers, had to do with mobility. So mobility does play a very critical role. And um, a couple of them only addressed autonomous uh, vehicles, even though it's very much in the discussion. Autonomous vehicles have been there. Uh, how many of you have ridden the metro in Paris? There's several of the cars are autonomous. There's no driver in them. So we have them. They ha they're not something new, but how to use them and where to use them is critical. So if Paris is using them in the metro, it really works. Can we use them for, uh, you know, transportation of large, uh, you know, trucks across the highways of the United States, which is what is being anticipated. I'm not so sure as to the footprint or impact that it would have. They certainly are touting a lot of the, the, um, the environmental benefits of it, but the social disruption, I think one of the issues that has come about in these discussions very, uh, very much, and especially in the videos, is that we have innovation and technology on the one hand, but social equity and social justice has to go hand in hand with it. Otherwise, whatever technological advances we have will be irrelevant and not effective in the right way. So I think one of the things that, that we need to address is how do we anticipate the future? I think much of what we did including the iPhone, came out of the, an innovation culture that really had to do with the war. You know, World War II led to a lot of innovation in universities, and uh, including my own, uh, MIT, and a lot of the, the, the innovation uh, laboratories at MIT, Rad Lab, et cetera, are, are related to uh, innovations that had to do with war. Uh, so, and, and the computer is one of the major results of that. How do we anticipate doing something that ha doesn't have to do with war, but actually has to do with the betterment of future of uh, mankind? I think it's climate change. I think climate change is as uh, significant and important in everyone's life um, as any uh, war would ever was. And I think that we have to create innovation hubs, and again, all of this has to do with education. Cities are the best resource for creating those hubs of innovation, and we should encourage them, both from the private sector and the public sector. Yeah, uh, I know that we are supposed to answer questions, but I'm going to make a, a question myself. That uh, it, Does anybody know who are uh, the city makers, who are the players that are making the cities? Uh, there's not any specific one. I mean, I'm an urban designer, and uh, I'm not responsible for designing a city. I'm just responsible for designing a part of a city. So there are so many players involved in the urban development that right now I think it's necessary uh, to find out who is the one that's taking the role, because it's so complex that we cannot solve it, solve it from different parts. Huh? That's why uh, from IE University, next year we are launching uh, a new bachelor in cities. It's a four-year program that uh, there are a bachelors about urban studies, about urban design, but not a bachelor where the main objective and the main uh, objective of study uh, is the city. And this is the case, because uh, from my uh, personal point of view, I think that we are missing somebody or a professional that could deal with the complexity, with the huge complexity of a city, that we are so many actors. We are talking about mobility, city engagement, resources, from where does it come the energy, the water. I mean, I don't know anything about all of these issues. I know a little bit about all of these issues. So uh, it's really important to find out who are the professionals that can deal with uh, this situation. And I will go a little bit further. This is something that should be teached in high school. 
or in elementary, a city subject. And that's probably the way that we can engage everybody and they will know that walking is the best solution for going to school and the best way of enjoying life. That is another issue, a really important one. Mm, I want to continue where Mina left. Uh, cities have all, always been formed around trade. It's, it's about trading things and goods. Uh, however, the physical objects, doesn't, the trade of the physical ob uh, object doesn't happen in cities anymore. We have logistics centers and, and, and ports and airports for that. Um, but cities still exist and they thrive and they, and they keep on growing. And I read that in, in many different occasions and, and that the cities nowadays, the trial of the cities is based on trading ideas and innovations. So it's about uh, abstract things, uh, information, new ideas, opinions, and so on. And when you think about innovation, it's can you innovate when you're stressed? I can't, so what cities should be fo focusing on is to um, decreasing the stress on every different aspects on citizens' life. One of the aspects is mobility, and there's pl pl uh, plenty of more aspects there, but uh, we can start planning our transportation system so that it creates the least stress. Uh, and, and one of them is just focusing on really the basic elements when, when you uh, switch from metro to bus, that there are signs and it's, it's easy, easy, easy to navigate and you don't even have to look the signs, you just know where, where to go and bus comes in every five minutes so you don't have to know the timetables and it's really the basic stuff that matters uh, just focus on the basic stuff and and you go a long way Chuck, you wanted to jump in um our colleague from baltimore asked a hard but legitimate question about automated vehicles or self-driving cars and it might sound theological, but I subscribe to the heaven or hell theory of uh, self-driving cars. And the, the heaven scenario is uh, I don't need to own a car. A car comes. Um, I don't need to park. So that real estate given to parking lots goes away. Maybe the lanes could be smaller because these cars are safer, allowing for other modes. That's all heaven. Uh, the hell scenario is uh, if it's air conditioned and I have a computer screen and I got good acoustics, I can do two hours of work before I arrive at my office and I could be living in Pennsylvania and having to go through Baltimore to, to get here. So this density vision that we're talking about is not uh, achieved in this uh, health scenario. Very hard to model. I think if our European counterparts are, are learning more, um, I, I work with other metropolitan planning organizations across the country and um, you know, we just don't know. So if you all know, please, uh, please tell us. Help us all to model that. Yes. I would like to answer uh, the question of the person on the back. Um, thank you for that uh, really interesting question. Um, I mean, uh, the distinction between the natural environment and the cultural social environment, I think it's just a kind of methodological uh, issue. Of course, we live in a natural environment, and even this room that we are here is an ecosystem. And the way that uh, to address sustainability is to understand how this ecosystem works. Uh, um, I mean, we've been talking about new technologies and how uh, they can improve uh, sustainability. And I was looking before if there's, I think it's in my back. Yeah, I think it's here. Yeah, there's a small screen on the back that is saying uh, the temperature of the room. And it could be nice that that screen could be huge and with more data. Let's say from where does it come the energy? Um, what should we do uh, to cool down the temperature rather than using energy? The first, uh, my recommendation is to untie your tie, <laughs> take out your jacket, and that's why we can help the natural environment. And um, from where can we get the energy? I mean, we are just close to the river, the Potomac River. Our soil is really fresh and cold. We are almost in the underground. I don't know if it's underground completely or not, but we are close. So we can use geothermal energy to cool down this, 
this room without ties, geothermal energy, and a big screen, we can make the natural environment much better. Manuel, we need to bring you by the uh, Atlantic Council so you can talk to my CEO in our HR departments about uh, <laughs> some dress code issues because uh, I'm fully on board with you, but uh, we, we suffer in ties nonetheless for no apparent reason. Um, with that, this has been a terrific discussion, uh, a wonderful and wide-ranging discussion. Um, we tied together two themes that at first blush might seem separate or not directly related, but I think in the course of today's conversation, we revealed that they are inextricably intertwined. Um, in the year 2050, uh, there will be nearly 10 billion people on this earth. More than 50% of them will be under the age of 30. More than two-thirds of them will be living in cities and urban areas. To say that youth and the, and the future of sustainable cities are important to the future is an understatement. What we are addressing today is the future of life on this earth. And it goes beyond borders. It goes beyond nationalities. It is not an issue of nation states. Uh, it is an issue of shared challenges and shared opportunities. So with that, um, uh, please both join me in thanking this panel, but also please stay in your chairs because uh, as we exit the stage, uh, it will be a, a distinct pleasure and honor to open up or to, to welcome up to the podium um, and to close out today uh, some final remarks from Ambassador Stavros uh, uh, Lambrinidis, Lambrinidis uh, Ambassador of the European Union to the United States. So with that, thank you very much and let me welcome up the Ambassador. <laughs> Good morning, dear friends. It's, uh, it's really great to be here and nice to see you. Some faces from old days and, and new. Uh, uh, really great to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, let me first start by expressing my uh, deep appreciation to all those who spoke here um, today, both in person and, uh, and on screen, for being, uh, uh, frankly, climate ch uh, action champions. Um, I am particularly grateful to the Embassy of Sweden, um, to Karen, is Karen around? I guess, no? To the Ambassador uh, for partnering with us on this uh, Climate Diplomacy Week event. Uh, to all those who joined us uh, from across the pond. Uh, to other EU embassies in Washington, D.C. for supporting our event. And of course, to our American partners. Power to the people, power to the people, literally and figuratively. That's what the European Union is all about when it comes to energy and climate. The power of, of information that information gives to people who possess it to understand what is happening in the world, why it is fundamentally important for our survival, for our well-being, to address the science of climate change, to listen to what those who deal with it on a daily basis for years tell us, and to change our ways to make this planet savable. The political power that comes from people speaking out on these issues, the European elections were the most classic example only two days ago of the people expressing through the power of the vote their deep concern about climate change and their deep desire and in fact a demand on the politicians that they vote in Europe to deal with this challenge. If you look at the figures for the 18 to 25s uh, who voted in the European elections, many people were predicting that this is the uh, demographic that would actually go for the anti-European parties that would uh, in large numbers express concern uh, and skepticism towards Europe. And in fact, if you look at the exit polls, you will see that the great majority of those people voted for a strong, for a united Europe with the message that it has to continue and intensify its efforts to protect the environment power to the people to take control over their own consumption of energy, information about how to do this and how to become more conservationists ourselves, each one separately. Yes, indeed, it is, in fact, a battle that everyone has to give in their own home, in their own office. And then you multiply this and you have a huge global success. It's not something that you give to someone else. It's power to you, power to the people to get this done. Uh, and of course, power to the people 
in, in, in a literal sense, in a sense that is conservationist, in, the words that in, 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 a way, in, a, in a way that ensures that, for example, our buildings uh, are, um, uh, are zero energy uh, very soon. This is a commitment of the European Union. A way to ensure that everything that we actually consume, we actually produce in the places that in which we stay. In fact, literally, power to the people. So, dear friends, this is what we're all about in the European Union. And today I would like to reiterate the EU's steadfast commitment to the Paris Agreement and the essential multilateral framework governing global action to deal with global warming. The Paris Agreement is powerful and continues. We regret the fact that the United States announced it would leave. It hasn't yet. Um, but everyone else is keeping their commitment to the Paris Agreement, and I am very proud and very thankful uh, for that to our partners uh, around the world. Um, the current level of efforts and commitments uh, remains important but insufficient. Um, I spoke before about the science. It's clear. The urgency to act remains. We're headed for temperature increases which could prevent our planet from remaining hospitable for the generations to come. We owe it to our children and grandchildren to stand up to the occasion, but as I said, happily, our children and grandchildren are not waiting for us to make all the decisions. Us with the gray hair, apologies, but I have some, so I can just say that without offending anyone in the room. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they voted for it. They're voting for it. Um, now, and that's why we also wanted to, uh, to feature some of those activists, young activists uh, today. Now, we Europeans have taken very ambitious steps to implement the Paris Agreement uh, and deliver on our pledges for 2030. We are on, um, well on track to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% uh, by 2030, and 45% seems within reach uh, as well. And our emissions are already more than 20% lower than uh, 1990 levels. Now, this contrasts unfavorably, I have to say, with U.S. emissions um, that uh, have increased. So in all our conversations with our U.S. Uh, friends and partners, we emphasize that this is um, uh, not the way to go, that we want to be working together to see how we can keep supporting each other in reducing uh, you know, our joint emissions around the world. Uh, and our success has been uh, partly thanks to a carbon market, which has been an effective tool to reduce emissions, uh, partly due as well to the energy mix that we are developing to reach our goal of uh, of um, uh, carbon neutrality by, uh, by 2050. Uh, uh, we are using um, uh, new energy, less, uh, less uh, polluting energy as a transition, including uh, LNG, and we have a very good cooperation with the U.S. Uh, uh, business and uh, U.S. administration on this as well, because we do have to transition to the zero, and that's precisely what we are, uh, what we are doing. Now, we're putting our money where our mouth is, the European Union is the world leader in climate finance, contributing up to 95% of the Climate Adaptation Fund and 50% of the Green Fund. In 2017 alone, the EU and its member states contributed over 20 billion euro in climate finance, and we are moving towards a climate neutral economy by 2050. Are we being kumbaya? Typical Europe? trying to save the world, doing things that don't appear to actually be helping its own interests, just to be nice to the world? Well, let's see. An increasing number of American cities, states, businesses, civil society organizations have understood that the Green Transformation offers tremendous opportunities. It's not a tale of blood, sweat, and tears, as some would wish us to believe. It's not killing industry. It is regenerating it. On the demand side, we are becoming less energy intensive. And that is simply a requirement to survive tomorrow's economy. In the supply side, the faster you move towards a carbon neutral business model, the higher your profits and market share will be. If you look for enduring sustainable growth, you need to think green. And I am pleased to see so many success stories of American entrepreneurs who have launched new business ideas and concepts. Renewables are also becoming profitable much faster than originally anticipated. Now, the European Union stands ready to increase its cooperation with the United States on decarbonization. We already work with a large number of American cities through the global governance of mayors, as you know, 
which is co-chaired by the European Union, and several of these cities are represented uh, here today, so thank you. We also support the International Urban Cooperation Cities to City pairing program, which allows cities from both sides of the Atlantic to cooperate on sustainable urban mobility, the circular economy, climate resilience, urban regeneration, and inclusive economic development, a big part of the discussion now about this, uh, and Baltimore is, for instance, part of this program. Who's here from Baltimore? All right. Uh, good job, as, <laughs> as someone I know would say. Great job. Great job, Baltimore. <laughs> and we also work with U.S. states, such as with California, on carbon emissions and clean energy. But so much more needs to be done, so much more. Now, as you know, I mentioned before, 2019 is a year of transition for the European Union. We had European Parliament elections last week, and we will have a new Parliament, uh, European Commission, uh, taking office in November. Uh, there may well be a redefinition of some political priorities. Uh, it always happens, but what will certainly not change is our determination to act on climate, because European citizens overwhelmingly ask for it. A recent survey showed that nearly 80% of Europeans are concerned or alarmed about climate change, there's a consensus in Europe for ambitious decarbonization and sustainability programs. So, dear friends, count on us to do the right thing. And count on us to work with our American friends to try to ensure that we can be working side by side. I am the ambassador of the EU, so I suppose I was picked partly because people thought that I was, you know, a, a, a hopeless optimist about everything in the world. And I am. I really am. I think that the United States and the European Union working together on a number of topics, including the climate, can be the greatest forces of good. And I will do my utmost, working with our friends in the United States administration, working with the White House, working with cities and states, working with activists around this country, both to hopefully inspire through the work the European Union does, but also to be inspired by the work that you do in this country. Uh, and, uh, and to eventually, I hope, hand in hand, uh, lead to a much more prosperous, much more safe, much more hopeful, much more green world. So once again, thank you for what you're doing today and every day to respond to the calls of action from our youth and vulnerable communities. Let's do it. Thank you very much.